still try to outdo each other like the way they've always done. But instead of over 15 miles, today it's half of one. Around a noble racetrack where big dollars are their prize. This modern sport is a race through hell where the history still survives. From the days of the 1800s all across the prairie lands, to the racetracks of the modern day, from Calgary to Cheyenne. Well, the old west has sure come alive with the running of the wagon race, chop wagon. No one has worked with more wagon horses and watched more races than Chuck Wagon Matriarch Iris Glass. She knows what it takes to make a wagon man. The first thing you have to love a horse and you have to know a horse. Be a good horseman. That is the first thing you have to be. And then you got to have lots of guts, if that's the word to say. And and uh, because it is a a really rough sport, really. I guess it was late in '39 or something. He had a real bad accident. He upset his wagon and broke 16 bones in his body. My dad, so he quit then and my brother took over Jack and he drove till 1945, I think it was. And then I married Ronnie and on he went for, he drove for 46 years. Then Tommy started and he's drove for 28. Now I got Jason, he's on his third one. So into my fourth generation. For 70 years we've been going. The glass lauder connection to the chuck wagon goes back even further, back to the early ranching era and to Iris's grandfather, John Doc Lauder, who followed the range chuck wagon as a foreman of the huge Cochrane Ranch. Young Westerners wanting to follow the chuck wagon would now have to prove themselves in the race. Calgary Stampede creator Guy Wiedek was dedicated to preserving a sense of the real West. It was in his home state of New York where Wiedek demonstrated his first chuck wagon race along with a number of other Western events. This guy had been involved with uh, one of the first rodeos in New York at uh, the Sheep's Head Arena. That was in 1916. And at that time, he brought together um, two chuck wagon races, two chuck wagons, and they performed a race there, complete to lighting the stove and doing all that kind of thing. So at that time, Guy saw that as a promotional thing. It was kind of a gimmick. It wasn't part of the true contest. But he also saw the, the, how the crowd loved it and how excited they were to see these actual activities that the cowboys were doing. In 1923, when Calgary organizers were looking for exciting new events for their new annual stampede, Wiedek proposed a chuck wagon race. It was an idea that he was convinced was wonderful, but a lot of people weren't that convinced, particularly a lot of the ranchers who didn't want to use the perfectly good stock and, and, and uh, chuck wagons in something that was, sounded a little, little harebrained. To test the driver's skill, each outfit was expected to make a figure eight turn around two barrels. Then the wagon and crew were to race around the track, return to their start position, unhook, and set up camp. The first outfit to raise smoke won the race. I think it was called a rangeland rumpus ruckus or something, some kind of um, alliterate, alliterative name that really summed up what it was all about. It was, it was a lot of fun, it was messy, the rules were raw, people made mistakes and people were crashing into each other, but the infectious excitement that really characterizes chuck wagon races began at, right at that first stampede. The 1923 races involved two heats of three wagons each. Each outfit was organized in a similar fashion to a range roundup crew. The winning wagon had outriders from various Mosquito Creek ranches, a driver from Streeters, and a wheel team supplied by Dan Riley, and a lead team from Cross's A7 ranch. Guy Wiedek hadn't made many rules, but Perma's Creek rancher Clem Gardner, who had the first night's fastest run of 3 minutes and 15 seconds, was disqualified for facing his wagon in the wrong direction. That small error cost Gardner the race and eventually the show. Mosquito Creek rep Dan Riley of High River collected the first ever chuck wagon trophy. 
a Stetson hat. That 23 stampede was one that was celebrating the pioneers of the Old West at that time. So it was very appropriate that they chose the chuck wagon. But Guy Wiedek wanted the wagons to be more than just an exhibition. What he wanted to do with the stampede and with the chuck wagon race was make it a real contest. This wasn't a show anymore. He wanted a contest with honest cowboys out there performing. You couldn't find a more honest, true-to-life cowboy than Clem Gardner. Skills learned riding the open range helped Gardner win the all-around championship at the very first 1912 Stampede. And he was the winner aboard Hightower of the Saddle Bronc Championship at Calgary's 1919 Victory Stampede. Always a tough competitor in the chuck wagon races, Clem Gardner was one of the first to drive hot-blooded thoroughbred stock. Another man who had eaten many a meal off the back of a chuck wagon, Jack Morton, also competed in the first chuck wagon race. Morton was as rambunctious as the event itself. His favorite pets were a pair of badgers. Morton, alias Wild Horse Jack, was one of the biggest ranchers and farmers in Alberta and stories of Jack's wild escapades were only matched by those of his humanity and generosity. The same fella who would hook up four unbroken broncs to drive at the stampede, who was known to throw his driving lines aside and slap his half-wild wheelers with a slicker, was also known to gift a drought-stricken farmer not only with a team of horses, but the harness for them as well. Morton's generosity went so far as to have his ranch cook, Horace Inkster, and the CX crew make breakfast for all and sundry in downtown Calgary during the 1923 Stampede, the first ever Stampede pancake breakfast. Early chuck wagon competitors were required to enter at least one other rodeo event. Jack Morton entered the wild horse race and occasionally competed with another legend of chuck wagon racing, Tom Lauder. Dad started before I was born. He used to have a Democrat team, they called it a Democrat buggy with four wheels or something. They used to drive that all over the country. They had those kind of races. And then when Guy Weedy decided to have this Calgary deal, he thought, oh boy, that's it. I'll have one of them chuck wagons. So in he come. And he went in Calgary here three times. Because he was only assessed a one second penalty for the infraction, Tom Lauder set a track record that stood for years when he cranked his outfit directly onto the track without bothering to make the required figure eight turn. And the judges had to keep increasing the penalty for missing a barrel until it reached 10 seconds per offense. That's when the wily Lauder decided it was worthwhile completing the figure eight turn. Tom Lauder wasn't the only one to stretch the rules. That second year of wagon racing, so many outfits doused kerosene on the wood or straw in their stoves that the rules had to be changed. In 1925, competitors were no longer required to make a camp and a fire. The first wagon across the finish line was declared the winner. For the young man who accomplished this feat, it was his first stampede victory, but definitely not his last. The young man's name was Cosgrave. Dick Cosgrave and his 1925 win was to be the first of 10 Calgary Stampede Championships. Cosgrave had been a pretty fair bronc rider, but it was in chuck wagon racing that he would excel. The sport became so much a part of his life that he used chuck wagons on his Christmas cards. It was largely due to Dick's attention to detail, knowing that a championship team was just that, a team that made him so successful. I know Dick was a top skinner, and he, he tended to put a top outfit together and could drive them, and the same as outriders. He had top outriders all the time, you know. Penalties could be costly, so young men who were recognized for their ability were often asked to ride behind several different outfits. Orville Strandquist entered the Stampede's winner's circle 12 times as an outrider. But in the early days of this dangerous sport, the pickings were slim. 
yeah, you could feed yourself and go to the river to drink because nobody got paid for out riding in them days. Orville's first year of driving a chuck wagon didn't pay much better. And the money wasn't too good that time. I think I got a twelfth. I split twelfth with Crow Child. So we each got $10. And the folks at home, anybody said, did you get any money? Oh, sure. They never even asked me how much it was. <laughs> streamlined horses were the name of the game. And drivers streamlined their wagons, too, even going so far as to remove the wagon's namesake, the chuck box. The chuck wagon races have always been colorful, but especially so after drivers and their outriders were required to wear matching colored shirts. It meant a lot of quick changes for top outriders like Lark Isbell. Everybody had their own different colored shirt. We'd put on about five shirts, and then you'd rip them off as you come in off the track, and about halfway through, you'd have to jerk on some more shirts. Was to put all nine shirts on was just a little bit bulky and a little bit too hot. Since the mid-1940s, it hasn't been difficult to tell which is the glass wagon. The family's checkerboard tradition began the year Ron and Iris Glass were married. They were traveling from Hannah to Coronation in their three-ton truck loaded with horses and equipment. An unruly wheeler had kicked the front of the wagon out in Hannah. So Ronnie was pleased when they noticed a dead end sign lying by the side of the road. Ronnie said, oh, look at there, there's a nice board, just fit the end gate. So I jumped out and threw it in and we put it in, we got to Carnation and I said, boy, that really looks nice, now I'm gonna paint the rest like that. The change in colors didn't hurt at all. The next year, Ron Glass won his first Calgary Stampede Championship. And when he won again in 1947 and 1949, Glass qualified as only the second driver after the legendary Dick Cosgrave to win the coveted Gas Company Trophy. Several years later, he won the first and only wagon race in the snow, stage four then Princess, now Queen Elizabeth. But Ron Glass claimed he was really in the business of selling horses, not chuck wagon racing, much to the chagrin of his wife, Iris. Oh boy, Ron used to buy a team and get four horses working and oh, they'd be really good. He'd just go a whole year and just win, win, win and then somebody would like them so he'd sell them. Oh, I used to get really, really upset, really upset with him. Some of Glass's toughest competition came from the partners in the Buffalo Hills outfit, Hank Willard and Lloyd Nelson. You gotta really drive in old days and like Hank and me, we, we drove. 10, 12 horses in the field since we were little guys, so driving was no big deal. The use of whips had been banned in the late 40s, so drivers had to use less forceful techniques to encourage their horses to turn and run. Hank and Lloyd uh, were my idols when I was a kid because they were closest to me. I knew them, and they were champions, and they knew how to handle a horse make it do what they wanted and make it want to do what they wanted without being unkind and that makes you a horseman. After their outfit was cut down in 1950, a devastated Nelson quit driving for a year and Hank Willard took over the lines. Willard patched together a new outfit, came back to Calgary and won the 1951 show. In a sport where spectacular wrecks were common, Hank was a fearless competitor. Old Hank was a character. He'd come out on that track and that wheel would be off the ground for 100 feet sometimes, just balancing. But he never weakened. He was pouring her on all the time. And Hank kept on winning until he racked up a phenomenal run of five consecutive Calgary Stampede Championships. Sadly, Willard's streak ended the way it had started, with an accident. Hank lost his great lead team, Skeeter and Vino Tinto, on the road in a trucking accident. He never married, he just uh, was in love with his horses. I see when he lost his horses, he cried like some people did if they lost some part of their family. It was appropriate that Willard's former partner, Lloyd Nelson, replace Hank on the winner's podium. Nelson would be the last man to win the Calgary Stampede driving under his own name without support from a sponsor. 
Ranch names and brands have been on the canvases since racing began. But actual sponsorship started in 1941 when the Buckhorn Guest Ranch paid Marvin Flett to carry their canvas. A fine horseman, Marvin came close but never did win the stampede. But his brother Dale made up for it by training seven championship outfits. Dale Flett was a fierce competitor, even when riding a bronc with a wig for a movie camera. When I was driving wagon or riding racehorses when I was a small kid, I always wanted to be first. Flett took calculated risks on the track, but left nothing to chance with his equipment and especially with his horses. Lloyd Nelson will never forget the time he tried Dale's outfit. I've driven some real good outfits in my day, I think, but nothing like that outfit. They just, they just work like a machine, every one of them. Every horse is important, but a top outfit needs agile leaders up front to make a quick figure eight turn around the barrels and capture the inside rail position. Dallas Dorchester grew up watching his father Tom's superb lead team of Blondie and Big Shot. They were both 21 and 20 when they were done as on the chuck wagon, and uh, actually Blondie was a three-year-old when he started, so she had quite a life. Never had a blemish on her. She's just a little horse, but she could turn and uh, he could beat anybody out of the barrels with him. Tom Dorchester believed that a race was won or lost in the first few seconds. Okay, we're set here for heat two. Brasso Datsun on one, Crossroads two, Eckwell on three, Burn Mood Sales of Thorsby on four. The stove is in ten poles are all in there. Look at Tommy Dorchester getting off the two barrel, but he's not going to grab the rail. That goes to Ron David in the Brasso outfit. Dorchester knew that a quick barrel turn often made the difference between being first or an also ran. Wagon racing was Tom's life. He loved it and so did his family. Two sons, Gary and Dallas, and his son-in-law, Dave Lewis, went on to be champions. Tom's boys and many others got their start with Cliff Claggett's traveling rodeo show. Pete Mullaney remembers one of Claggett's caravans. Nine trucks going down the road, and the front one had a license plate on it. We traveled all down through the Maritimes, down through Toronto and Boston, down through that country with only one license plate. <laughs> Traveling with Cliff Cleggett exposed young men to the sport, but no amount of desire could replace the advantage of being born into a chuck wagon family. Once the kids grow up, they generally start out riding and then they go on to driving and, uh, you know, it it's, uh, makes for a better competitor, the kids that have grown up in it. Richard Cosgrave's grandfather was the legendary Dick Cosgrave. His father, champion driver, Bobby Cosgrave. The first race I ever drove was in Statler. I was 14 and we went up there, it was a benefit deal. And Dad had some out riding horses hooked together, so he was hooked with Tommy Dorchester and Bob Barrett, I think it was. And uh, we pulled in the barrels and he said, do you want to drive? I said, sure. So he jumped out and Mum was in the grandstand. She went wild, but I was about 40 wagon lengths behind and ate a lot of dust. And, Ron Glass decided to give Richard some barreling lessons. One of my first big outfits I drove for Ronnie out there practicing at his place. He said, get up there, kid, and drive him. So Tom, he got behind the seat and he was a little shaky. And Tom, or Ronnie used to set the barrels really tough and then have a fence right there so they had to turn. So I went up and I went by the top barrel, I don't know, about 60 feet. And on the way back and I cranked the bottom and Tom's going, don't turn him, don't turn him. And old Ronnie said the kid's going to make a wagon driver because I did turn him and we were going 9-0. Cosgrave, Glass, Willard, and Dorchester, each racing dynasty had a founder. And in 1969, a new dynasty began, a new era began, with the arrival of Kelly Sutherland and the record. Well, here we are again today, risking our lives for very little pay. But it's a life we'll choose and it's a life we'll live. And Lord, we don't ask anyone to give. But we want to thank you, Lord, for the many trouble-free miles that we travel each year. Up and down the highways and the dusty old roads, knowing that you're near. Now, we ain't always been straight or took a religious stand. 
But when we crawl up on the seat of that wagon and look back at the family, there's someone we truly believe in, and you're the man. And we turn them barrels, and she lifts up on two. I sometimes hear a little voice saying, Don't worry, son, I'm in here too. In the past, you've taken a few drivers, a few outriders, even the odd child or two. But really, Lord, no one has ever blamed you. So we don't ask that you take us to heaven or never run in stormy weather. But when it's all over and you gather since your mighty kingdom come, would you please keep us all together?